and welcome to our seventh episode of Hungry Talks. I'm your host, Bella. And I'm your other host, Alana. And first of all, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge the people of the Wurrung and Wurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nation on whose unceded lands we conduct the business of the university. RMIT respectfully acknowledges ancestors and elders past and present, the traditional custodians and their ancestors of the land and waters across Australia. Tonight, we are looking into the role that many creatives are shooting for, creative direction. We'll get to know a little bit more about the life of an executive creative director and how to find creativity in unexpected places and take a look at our guest viral Instagram page, turning children's drawings into photoshopped masterpieces. We're in for a good one, folks. And tonight for us, but this morning for him, we are very lucky to be joined by the incredibly talented and highly skilled executive creative director of Mediacom, all the way from London, Tom Curtis. Welcome, Tom. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here on the screen with you. Thank you so much. Um, so, Tom, let's get right into it. What exactly does the day-to-day -day of an executive creative director look like? Right. Good question. So, <laughs> interesting enough, I am an uh, exec creative director in a media agency, not in a creative agency, and therefore my role, I suspect, is probably a little bit different. Um, so I'm sorry if I'm going to talk a little bit more about my own specific experience, not uh, that of the general ECD uh, in, in an ad agency or many other different agencies. So um, to give a little bit of background, I've been at Mediacom 21 years uh, and have almost kind of created the role myself because it was not a role that existed within uh, Mediacom before. Mediacom uh, traditionally was a media planning and buying agency, as many of uh, the viewers will hopefully know what that is. Um, but uh, over the last 15 years, actually, so most of the time I've been there, we've really developed our creative credentials. Um, first of all, we launched a digital uh, creative team, which I founded with another fellow in the, in the business. Um, and we were doing a lot of kind of banners um, and a lot of digital kind of website builds and stuff and, and moving into apps. But then um, the term content started to be used a lot within the industry. It had already been used for decades within the TV industry, but in, in, in media and PR and, uh, and ad agencies, a lot of people were talking about content. And we created a team called uh, Mediacom Beyond Advertising, uh, which basically produced a whole load of content. I'm going to get to the question in a minute. I've just remembered you've asked me what the day to day thing is that I do, but I need to give that context. Yeah, this is so, good to um, know. Good. So with, within Mediacom Beyond Advertising, which is uh, more recently uh, kind of relaunched as, um, as a team called Creative Systems uh, within Mediacom, we do all sorts of stuff. We do, uh, we do events, we do uh, TV shows, so uh, exec produced TV shows, um, or kind of brand funded ones. Uh, we do uh, social media, we do influencer marketing, we do uh, SEO, search engine optimization, uh, and we do a huge number of media partnerships. Um, in addition to the odd kind of uh, more traditional creative campaign. Now, um, oh, and also, sorry, and also another big area is addressable creative. Um, so there's a big, big growth area, which maybe we'll talk about later, maybe not. But uh, it, adapting your creative messaging to the different platform and to different audience. Uh, so that's another big thing we do. So as, a, as a, an ECD uh, in a team that does all of that, uh, I have to kind of know about all of it. Um, and my key role really is to develop the big ideas that sit uh, above all of those things, um, what we call system ideas uh, or, or creative platforms that, um, that we write to sit above all of the different elements uh, within that that plan. So uh, I'm not really a specialist, I'm a, a jack of all trades. So um, I'll, I'll develop those uh, those big ideas with my with my creative team uh, and then work with the uh, the creative producers to develop in whichever uh, media that is required. So um, it's mainly big big picture stuff, but then there's um, obviously when it gets to execution, there's uh, some of that as well. Mediacom is the biggest media agency in the UK. It's one of the biggest in the world, but in the UK, it's, it's, it's the biggest by, by some margin. Um, and we're very fortunate to have uh, some enormous clients. So big global clients like Coca-Cola and uh, Adidas um, 
uh, for example, but then local clients like uh, Direct Line Group, big insurance company, or Tesco, a massive, um, uh, massive, massive supermarket chain, also Sky Television. Um, so that's the uh, that's biggest, biggest advertiser in the UK, I think, which I'm very heavily involved in. So some pretty decent, decent clients. I mean, there's a whole load more, um, which I'll probably talk about a little bit as we, as we go on. Cool, amazing. Yeah, so our next question is, how did you kind of initially break into like the media and, and um, industry and stuff? So I did an art degree uh, many, many years ago, visual arts, it was, uh, including a bit of art history and a bit of design and whatever else. Uh, and I came out of that thinking I wanted to be a uh, graphic designer. And I traveled um, around the world and spent two wonderful months in Sydney. Um, oh, wow, there you go. Uh, and, uh, and I came back and I sat at my desk ready to put my portfolio together. And I realized I didn't want to be a graphic designer after all. Uh, within about 24 hours. And the reason why I didn't want to be a graphic designer was because I realized that actually I was a very good fine artist and I kind of, you know, figurative kind of stuff. Um, and I didn't think that that actually corresponded to uh, what was required as a graphic designer. And, and frankly, my education hadn't really um, specialized enough in graphic design. So um, I then really kind of went through a whole load of emotions about what I wanted to do next. And a lot of people you meet that uh, go into media agencies will often say they found themselves, I kind of fell into media. Um, but I was actually offered a job as a suit, um, an account handler in a creative agency at the same time as offered off a job as a media planner in a media agency. And I, and I really, um, I, it was a bit of a dilemma, but I recognized actually that in a media agency I had more opportunity to think strategically and to make decisions myself about the the way a client should spend their money and who they should target and in, a, in, a, in a, an ad agency I perceived that a a suit was basically just selling a creative's work and I really wanted to be that creative I didn't want to be selling someone else's stuff um, so what I did is I chose the media agency um, and, and this is before Mediacom. Um, and then I basically went, went to Mediacom and I saw an opportunity and took a business plan to my then MD about two or three years into my role at Mediacom and said, I want to be a creative and I want to set up a creative division within Mediacom. Uh, now, if I were to look back at that business plan now, it's probably just a flappy piece of paper, but I'd worked hard enough and proved myself within the business, I think, to make them want to keep me and make them realise that I did have a vision that was potentially viable. Um, so very fortunately, the, um, the MD then, a fellow called Nick Lawson, who is now the global CEO of Mediacom, uh, saw enough in me and saw enough of the opportunity to allow me to do it. So I, rather than leaving the company that I really wanted to be at um, and going into a job I wanted to be, I reshaped my, my role within Mediacom uh, and, and kind of uh, and took it from there. That's so cool. I think, yeah, that's really great paving your own future and your own career. I think that's awesome. Um, mm. Which, yeah, that, that kind of answered my next question of um, what made you stick with the agency for so long? I think um, it is important, actually, because I do find myself justifying that sometimes myself to, to people I meet. Why on earth would you spend 21 years in the same company? Mediacom is a wonderful place and I love the people there and there's a lot of people, particularly in Mediacom London, who have worked together for many, many years. Um, it's the best, biggest and best agency, uh, media agency in the UK. So why would we want to leave? Mm. Uh, and we really kind of, you know, that that friendship, the, the relationships we've developed, I think really, really help us. Um, the atmosphere um, I, I find at Mediacom has always been really, really positive. Uh, and I know the uh, the... The environment in some uh, agencies, particularly ad agencies in London, and I'm sure in other parts of the world, it can actually be quite uh, maybe toxic to to harder work. I'm, just, I'm sure it's a bit toxic in some, but you know the working environment can be really quite difficult and really really long hours. And of course, we do long hours, but but I've always found that uh, um, that MediaCom has been a great great place to work. But also, why have I stayed in media? 
uh, why have I decided to be a creative director in a media agency uh, as opposed to in an ad agency? And that is down to the fact um, that I always believed and still do to actually still do that media agencies really have the relationships um, that count, particularly with the clients and with the media owners. Um, we are doing more interesting work. Um, we have a fantastic opportunity to create more than just advertising. And that's, you know, a lot of the ad agencies or creative agencies, I often refer to them as ad agencies, are basically churning out ads. They're always thinking, let's create a TV script. Let's write a TV script, let's make a telly ad. Whereas we're thinking, which talent can we work with here? Which IP can we work with? Can we create a TV show? Can we partner with a film company? Can we do all of these other different things? Really, really interesting things to stick that as the kind of the big idea and then everything else kind of comes off it. Uh, and I, that is what I, I get so passionate about. And that's exactly why I've stayed at Mediacom so long. That's wonderful. No, that's, yeah, it's really interesting to hear that. And, and yeah, because we were going to say, you know, it's pretty common for um, creators to kind of move around in the different agencies so it's, it's really nice to hear that you know that it's such a good workplace that you do want to stay there which is mm. which is lovely um our next question is uh here in australia in particular in melbourne we often hear that um kind of the industry is quite small and everyone really knows everyone is that is that similar in england or very different <laughs> in the industry or in the, in the city generally uh, in the industry, but sure, in the city as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, London's a big place, right? Um, uh, the, the industry is, uh, I mean, look, if you compare it to other industries, it's actually really small, right? And if you read um, Campaign Magazine, for example, now online, then you'll, you'll, you'll hear about the same people over and over again doing the same things or sometimes different. Um, so it is quite small, really, but I think... Um, for more junior staff members uh, coming into the business, it probably doesn't seem that. It probably feels like there's loads of different agencies, there's loads of different ad agencies and media agencies. Um, you know, it's quite difficult to start kind of getting a foot on the rung to of, of you know, meeting other people from other agencies, particularly obviously in lockdown. It's been a very, very different thing because it's, you don't kind of bump into people in the reception, for example, you know, like we always used to. Um, but no, I mean, once you've once you've been in the industry a long time, it kind of does feel relatively small, and you do kind of realise that your your contact list is is pretty vast. I'd like to know what's your opinion of identifying as strictly an art director or a copywriter. Did you start out as one or the other, or you kind of just found your role organically? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so again, because I work in a media agency, it's not quite so strict. Um, we love hybrids. We love people who can do a bit of everything. Um, uh, we have in the past um, hired a, a, a pair, only once, actually a pair uh, with, a, with a copywriter and an art director. Um, but I mean, I think kind of things have moved on a bit for me. And, um, you know, we want people who are brilliant and passionate uh, uh, about lots of things. Um, you know, the jack of all trades comment about myself feels very relevant. I, I kind of think that it, it's quite an old school, traditional way to go. I am a designer and that is my writer. And together we create one thing because I think social media obviously has changed that dramatically where uh, a lot of different platforms allow lots of different types of creativity and you can create stuff. Um uh, in a kind of new, different way. So, because I can, I can design, um, but my my the the job I do actually is uh, mainly coming up with ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I remember actually the thing that really made me, really spurred me on in my decision to go back to my, my company and say I want to set up a creative team, is a creative um, division, is when I met. Um, a, a creative uh, an ad agency he was probably a copywriter in fairness to him but i remember him saying i can't draw hands it was a very <laughs> particular kind of uh, campaign that they were doing he said i can't draw hands and i sit there as a as a media planner thinking i can draw hands i can draw hands really <laughs> well uh, uh so i think <laughs> it's bizarre isn't it but I actually that that was the moment i really remember it going I can draw hands, so therefore I'm going to be a creative. There are there are people in the industry still who claim that 
to be a really, really good writer, you have mm. to specialize. To have to be a really good designer, you have to um, uh, you have to be able to you know you have to specialize in design. But but one of the other things to bear in mind is that there are so many other people out there that we can lean lean on. Um, you know, if we if we really want a fantastic designer for something, then we will hire one in as a, as a freelancer, for example. Um, you know, we want people who can come up with ideas and draw them so they can visualize it for the client and sell that idea in. So then we can go away and work out how best to, to produce it. And if that involves bringing talent externally, then then obviously we'll do that. Amazing. Well, thank, thank you, Tom. It, it has been really kind of exciting and um, inspiring to see someone in a role that a lot of us do aspire to, to and really cool to get a perspective on the advertising, not advertising, sorry, the media um, industry in London. Um, next up, we will take a look at some of Tom's work and find out what it is that really makes your work stand out, something worth hanging up on the family fridge. This is Fridge Worthy. Um, so, Tom, we'd love to know what has been the most influential or exciting campaign that you've ever worked on? You know, I was thinking about this and actually I'm going to go back quite far, but it, it feels very relevant because the campaign that, uh, that I think is, is one of my favourites is something that we did five years ago. But the reason why it's, it's relevant is because it was for the Paralympics, which is obviously happening right now. Right. So we, uh, we created uh, a campaign for Allianz Insurance um, when they sponsored the Paralympics in the UK. So they were the broadcast sponsors of the, um, the, the, the various transmissions for um, the Paralympics. This is it. I live for the games. At that moment, I dared to believe that I could go to the Paralympic Games. I think I'm the luckiest girl in the world because I followed my dreams. So that, that was in 2016 for the, for the Rio Paralympics. What was really interesting is that after 2012, London 2012, a lot of people really, and, and, and I'm sure this was around the world, but a lot of people really kind of stood up and noticed um, what was happening in the, the Paralympian movement. movement, And we were tasked with um, bringing a sponsorship opportunity to Allianz. And we, we took the Paralympics uh, sponsorship to them. Now, what was interesting is Channel 4, uh, the, the broadcaster in the UK, couldn't find, I, I think I'm allowed to say this, but couldn't find another broadcast partner. So it kind of indicated that Although everyone thought that it was a, a fantastic opportunity and that everybody, all brands would love to get involved, um, actually not many did. So, or, or, or any, in fact, apart from Allianz. And Allianz kind of took the plunge and, um, and they got it really quite cost effectively because Channel 4 were trying to sell it uh, as two different, um, two different uh, sponsorships, kind of split it in half, but Allianz took, took the whole lot. Anyway, uh, that's the media side. What what we did was we created the uh, the idents. There was no there was no ad agency, which which helped. So we created all the idents and we created lots of them. Um, and I find that often doesn't happen. So uh, often the ad agency will leave the idents, the, the the sponsorship break bumpers, to the end and go, oh, we've got to do those now and create one or two. But we created a lot with, with quite a few with as many uh, different talent as we could, and we. Uh, and we bought the media placement so that the um, so that we could match the uh, the brake bumpers with the actual uh, athletes in the events. Okay, so that's quite quite cool. Um, I can't remember exactly how we made, but it was quite a few. Also, um, uh, we partnered with a production company called Boomerang, which uh, part of Two Four, big production company in the UK, and they created amazing films um, uh, along the uh, the. Uh, the concept, the, the the line of dare to believe, which is the the line that we wrote for Allianz, and they create these amazing videos uh, of the athletes, and they won quite a lot, quite a lot of awards. Really, really chuffed with those. And then also we were involved in um, uh, a, the first sign language uh, ad break in the UK. So as part of this, Channel Four were um, really, really kind of getting behind the um, 
the, the, the Paralympics and they created this first ever sign language um, outbreak, which again, we were part of. So it, it, all together, it created a really, really interesting campaign and it felt, it shouldn't have felt brave, but it felt quite brave at the time because no other brands were, were kind of willing to get involved. What an amazing opportunity to be able to be a part of something like that. And um, at a time where brands weren't getting involved. Uh, what role did you specifically play in this? Were you a creative director at this point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, the whole writing of the, um, the, 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 con the concept with my, with my, um, my creative director at the time, I was actually in a more managerial role, funnily enough. I ran a team of 80 people. Uh, I yeah. never explained that, but I, I was running, <laughs> I was running a, a, the content division and um, it was only kind of later that I, I uh, took the role of executive creative director, but I was worked with my CD on the uh, on the concept of it, um, and then we produced all of the, um, the all the idents. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I was kind of you know doing the senior kind of thing of overseeing stuff and making sure everything happened and all that that, that stuff. Right. And how do you know when you've struck creative gold? Like when when is it time to stop? Uh, that's that's a that's a really that's a really good question. I was actually talking to someone about this the other day. Yeah. Um, you just know. I think you just know. Um, you know, as an ECD, uh, it's really really important that you don't take credit for other people's ideas, and uh, more importantly, that you recognise when there are brilliant ideas being being told to you and you you're kind of I, I find my job is to go yeah that one that's the one we're going to do that's the one we're going to develop um uh, and and that's kind of the, that's almost the skill but also the necessary the, the necessary role that an ecd plays again i don't really know what it how it works in um in in uh, most ad agencies i see you know i see a lot of um when an ad agency, for example, produces a, uh, a new campaign, you get a whole load of credits and it always starts with the ECD. And I'm thinking, well, has the ECD played that much of a role in that in that campaign? <laughs> you know, I mean, I was one of a number of people, you know, I, a number of people in the Allianz uh, campaign, just like I am in many of the campaigns we do. Um, you know, I would never position myself as the most important person in that campaign. Absolutely not. Um, you know, I had brilliant, a brilliant team underneath that were doing the majority of the work. And it's important to recognise that. So anyway, yes, critically, <laughs> when you hear an idea, you just know, you, 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 particularly if you've got a lot of experience and you've worked, you know, you know what wins awards, for example, and you know what clients want, you know what's going to hit the brief. Um, it's the most important skill, really, to kind of just go, right, that's, that's the one we're going we're gonna to push and we're going to do it collectively. Yeah, that's a really great point. It's it's just one of the skills that you have to develop, I guess, as a creative, knowing when it's time to put the pen down and be like, yep, this is it. This is good. Um, but yeah, thank you for taking us through that campaign. It sounds absolutely brilliant. Um, we'll now move to a segment that's all about the spark of inspiration. Where do you get your inspiration from? Is it movies, art galleries? What about children's drawings? Let's find out um, in this segment, this is Inspiration Everywhere. So viewers at home, you may be familiar with the Instagram account, Things I Have Drawn. Tom is actually the genius behind it. He takes kids' drawings and photoshops them into real life creatures. Tom, some of the work you and your kids have come up with is just absolutely fabulous. Can you take us back to where it all began for this page and how these drawings and Photoshop combos came about? Thank you. What a lovely intro. It, it's one of those ideas that um, just seemed to, well, I mean, it, as I say, it kind of went viral. It, 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 it's, it's exploded. Not many people were doing doing it. Um, I, I guess it, I, I often ask the question, how did I come up with the idea? Um, but I'll just take a little step back. Uh, in my job, um, I uh, was very aware that I should probably be doing something in Instagram. Uh, I think Instagram had been around five years or so. Um, and, uh, and my team, actually, someone in my team said to me, why aren't you on Instagram? I thought, I better be on Instagram. So I set up a personal account and just started, you know, posting the kind of stuff that people always post. My feet on the beach holding a beer and stuff. Um, not my feet holding the beer, my hands. <laughs> oh, thank God. Uh, and, and, and I did that for a few months. And then um, 
and I, and then and then I had this I had this idea for um for for what became things I've drawn and I uh, the, the standard story is basically I remember seeing a, a, a drawing that my kid had done uh, he's called Dom and he was I think five at the time and um, uh, like many kids he just drew the two eyes and the mouth on the side <laughs> of the head of the animal and I just like this and thought does he actually think that it looks like that does he actually think it looks like that because of course it doesn't look like that and then I thought and I you know basically I thought well maybe this is the kind of the spark because like well maybe actually he's right maybe us adults aren't looking properly and the kids have got it right and all kids are, are drawing exactly what they see and they're getting it right and us adults aren't looking properly uh and then I kind of took to photoshop and thought look I'll I'll, I'll do I'll, I'll experiment with that thought um and it was it was it was that I mean there was, there was no real magical moment um again a lot of companies have already been doing things with uh, with toys creating toys out of kids drawings there are a few other bits and kind of a few things that are similar which I only found later but um it was really kind of the persistence of of doing it and posting to Instagram uh over kind of quite a few months that then things started to kind of pick up and um and then and then it went viral it's it's clear to see from from it that you know your children are quite a you know big inspiration for you in in what ways do you foster creativity in your own children's upbringing like do you think they teach you a little bit to be take a more playful and like childlike approach to your own to your own um projects yeah that's, that's a good question as well i um so when i was a kid i was uh couldn't couldn't get a pencil out of my hand maybe a bit of an exaggeration but i drew a lot i drew a lot and my, my mum was an art teacher and my dad's brothers so my uncles on the other side were both art teachers i had a lot of art teaching in the family um and uh, and i loved it i absolutely loved it and of course we didn't have computer games kind of had computer games but not very good computer games uh in those days and that wasn't a distraction and i just drew all the time and my kids uh when they're young like many other kids were doing a lot of drawing um but then slowly over time other things get more interesting and inevitably uh gaming became more of a thing uh, and it it became very apparent that actually uh things I've drawn could be a kind of a, almost like a creative force for good not just for them to encourage them to do more drawing but also as we've kind of grown bigger um, I, I get around the world we get sent hundreds of pictures from people saying oh please can you kind of make our kids drawings real so um, I don't think my kids are quite into drawing uh, as I was as a kid Aww. but I'm, I'm definitely I'm definitely trying to spur them on um, <laughs> and, and uh, you know we're trying a few other different things obviously they're, they're, they're a bit older now so um, their own techniques are, are developing um, and they're, you know, Dom, for example, is brilliant at kind of cartoony drawings, like little characters. He's, I mean, genuinely talented at it. So uh, I, I'm trying to encourage him to do more of that. That's so cool. That's cool. Um, yeah, and I, I just see the pictures on the wall behind you. That's... A few, few behind. <laughs> yeah. I, I, mix, I mix up some of the, you know what, the, 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 the ones in the middle are, you know, their, their original drawings. And they're the ones that I think should be celebrated most. Um, they're the ones that you know the, the kids kids have got uh, fantastic I've got actually my cousins here oh, <laughs> there you go yeah there you go they, 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 they you know they just produce weird and wacky stuff they're not constrained by people saying oh that's not very good I hope they're not most kids shouldn't <laughs> um you know and and it's wonderful to see isn't it it's only when we get older that we start going oh oh i need actually it's funny because dom dom was just telling me yesterday one of the reasons why he doesn't um doesn't draw as much uh is because he keeps on seeing um other people's drawings on the likes of instagram and tiktok where it's kind of photo real and he goes i can't compete with that and i he shouldn't be competing with that because there's very little creativity um or imagination going into these these photo real drawings yes there's skill right but everyone's doing them Lo I mean, not mm. everyone loads of people are doing those things you know that's not imaginative you should be creating really cool different characters and experimenting with your own styles and all that kind of stuff um and i think there are far too many kids and um you know teens these days who are 
who are suppressing their own creativity because they're seeing that type of stuff on 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 social media and they really shouldn't you know mm. i mean picasso didn't look at photo real photographs and go uh, drawings or, or paintings and go oh, i'm not very good at i'm not as good at that so i won't do any um do any paintings that's a bit of a Bit of rubbish. No. <laughs> I, know, I get it. Yeah, no, he no, probably no. knew he was good. He probably yeah, knew. Yeah, he was good. Yeah. Yeah. But, Actually, he was quite. He was quite a good bit of artist before he went into Cuba. But anyway, yeah. yeah, that's the thing. Like once you grow out of um, childhood, it's like all of a sudden everything feels so judged, and it's so hard to like get your work out there and not be anxious about it. And um, yeah, I mean, you with eight hundred fifty thousand followers and. Um, campaigns and work that gets to be seen by a lot of people um, mm. I still get nervous pitching my ideas to the class let alone an agency um, so what are some of your tips to confidently share your work and stand by what you create uh, what a great question um, yeah so uh, there's, there's a very very clear bit of guidance I would always say and that is always have uh, a separate account for your work um don't ever mix up for the, uh, the kind of a basic point in this but don't mix up holiday photos and you know photos of you out getting drunk with your mates in the same um account as the things where you're sharing work to to be seen and you know i mean maybe that's a bit obvious but um but uh, i think i think it's it's important to be uh, confident in what you're producing and you know we're really fortunate we don't I'd get so few negative comments um, which is quite remarkable I think um, but it I, I think I'd be able to cope with the negative comments more because I'm of a certain age and I don't care as much um, I'm not glued to my phone uh, you know but, um, but it's important to be confident and it's important to know what you want to achieve. And I think it's also important to be quite consistent. So when people see your work, they know uh, that it's going to be from you. Uh, you know, and when, and when they see the next post, I mean, this is if you're kind of wanting to grow a grow a, a following, for example. You know, when someone reaches your, your um, profile, uh, if it's a whole load of random stuff, then they're probably not going to follow you. If they know that there's a consistent thread through everything, then they're going to know what they're going to get if they follow and then when they see more content coming up. But in terms of sharing generally, was, was that the question? Was it not, not just about social media, but sharing sharing your work generally? Yeah, to and pitching, in, pitching ideas. Yeah. Whatever yeah, I mean, it is, it's, it's about preparing. If you've got time to prepare, it's about preparing your pitch. You know, if you're not if you're not um incredibly lucid and you you know you you struggle a little bit presenting then i don't think there's any harm in learning your script because if you can get the message across i mean i see i see creatives do this a lot right they'll write a treatment and then i'll read the treatment and it's not a bad thing to do at all because you know all the superfluous words that you might use because you kind of go down a rabbit hole or whatever it might be and you you know you're you're thinking, oh, I can wing this a little bit. It is often unhelpful. So if you keep to a script and you kind of learn that script and you know that you've written that script to really sell that idea hard, then that's a really, kind of, I think, a really good bit of advice, really. Um, but it is about, it's, it's about confidence in your work and it's about understanding, you know, uh, what's good about it and explaining that to people you know there's a there's a lot of people out there that recognize that it's not just about the creativity it's about the sell you know it's about convincing someone that this is the right route that's that's my job you know so often in the past i've presented brilliant work think work that i think is absolutely brilliant and the client's not bought it for a whole load of subjective reasons and i'm left kind of banging my head against the, the wall going why 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 it's because I didn't sell it properly it's because I didn't convince them that this is the work that they should be buying um and that's that's a lesson that everyone kind of needs to learn and, and and understand oh and also think about what the think about what the audience wants think about what the client wants think about what they're looking for understand whether they're going to make a, a decision on a personal hunch understand whether they're really into the kind of the business uh, objectives of it really really understand what what that work is going to do for them um 
because otherwise, you know, they'll base it on a subjective point of view and um, and where you can use data to back up, use use numbers, use insights, you know, convince the client, convince the audience, whoever it might be. And I don't I mean, I don't do this in things I've drawn on on, on social, but, you know, where you've got maybe a good good planner or where you can yourself dig out interesting insights from from even from Google or whatever it might be and use that to explain why this is going to work why the audience is going to want to see this why this is going to be beneficial to the client that's some really really good advice sir I definitely think a lot of the students will be really happy to take that on and just ease their ease their, um, their nerves a little bit there um, one other question is you know do you find that having a creative passion outside of of um, kind of your professional work helps your creativity at work as well? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It helps and hinders a little bit. Um, I I can't turn off. Um, I, I I slept very little last night <laughs> because I was not because I was well, I was. So Still nervous not. about today, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I, no I, I didn't sleep last night because I was working quite late on something and then went to bed and I, I hadn't switched off properly. I didn't have any downtime. That was stupid. Um, but uh, it is when, when you're a, I wouldn't say, look, I wouldn't say you're a, only a true creative if you constantly are thinking and constantly thinking about creative creativity or thinking about ideas. But I do think it does, um, for, for, for a lot of people, it kind of sets them apart a little bit. If you're really passionate about it and you're really, really into what you're doing, then you, it, is a diff, it is difficult to, to, to switch off. Um, and there are many crossovers between what I do in my day job and what I do with the, the Instagram account. Um, you know, and it helps. Obviously, it, it does help that I'm able to talk to clients about stuff because I'm like, you know, know kind of what I'm, what I'm doing. Um, and, and the idea process is not dissimilar. Sometimes I'll sit down, I don't have enough time to really think about things I've drawn, but you know, if I did ever, I'd sit down and go, right, let's come up with a whole load of different ideas and then do, you know, pick the one that's best, for example. I wouldn't just go, first thing that comes into mind, let's do that. Well, I do that sometimes because I haven't got time otherwise. <laughs> I'll introduce myself a bit there. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely think um, creatives kind of have to immerse themselves in like creative culture, I guess, you know, like watch a movie that you wouldn't normally watch or look at some new art, things like that. Um, it's, it's, it, I, I agree, I agree. Yeah, I don't you really have to draw that. on something. So, yeah, totally, totally agree with that. Um, well, thank you. I think you're definitely a living example of um, work-life balance in the sense of, balancing that creativity outside of work as well as inside of work um, and yeah the way that you foster creativity um, outside of work and manage to incorporate your children um, as well is something really special I think um, so thank you for that now coming up Ben on the street which has been more like Ben online lately takes to zoom to prank some unsuspecting third years take a look <laughs> Every agency you're going to meet with feels qualified to advertise the Hershey bar because the product itself is one of the most successful billboards of all time. We've all heard of AMC's Mad Men. Well, whether you've watched the show or not, all you need to know is within Mad Men, we see a lot of great pictures by a character, Don Draper. In this episode, I've secretly grabbed some of his best and pitched them to unsuspecting third years who haven't seen the show. Let's see how the 1960s dramatised ad pictures hold up within a 2021 ad student environment. Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Ben on the Street. Today I'm joined by again three of my cohort in Year 3 Advertising where they're going to give me some honest opinion about three pictures I've prepared. So the first pitch that I've prepared is for an advertisement for Jaguar. So... Evelyn, Pat, and Noah, do I have permission to speak freely? Yes, of course. Go ahead. Of course you do. Okay. I know you forbid us for talking about the mistress, but I kept imagining the arsehole who's going to buy this car. 
Now, he's probably already got a lot of beautiful things. And one way or another, what he has isn't enough. So no matter what, the first idea has to be, finally, you're getting what you wanted. The copy that I've chosen is describing a car as another woman, but a woman you can't have because they all have the qualities of a Jaguar. Good looking, expensive, fast, and frankly, not practical. So the copy I've chosen is Jaguar. At last, something beautiful you can own. What do you think? If you're comparing it to a woman and then you're saying that you can own it, it's like, yeah. I yeah. feel like this conversation <laughs> about owning a woman, which is a little bit 1950s, but I really liked the direction that it was going in. I think um, drawing that parallel was really interesting. Mm. Like it would definitely make me interested, but I think just using the word. Yeah, like, definitely own, the owning like, thing is a bit. Yeah. Maybe use like yeah. have or something, but then I feel like that's not as punchy. I don't know. Yeah, I, I also, I like the, like, the parallel between the car and the and woman, the woman. like, yeah. flipping it on its head, because it is kind of a, like, an old-fashioned comparison, but yeah, mm. you know, it's a little bit aggressive. Mm. Mm. Yeah. The other pitch that I've got now is for a lipstick brand called Belle Jolie, I think it's a French brand, so the pitch I have for you guys today goes like this. Every woman wants a choice, but in the end, n- none want to be one of a hundred in a box. The person that wears this lipstick, she's unique. She makes the choices and she chooses him. She wants to tell the world he's mine. He belongs to me, not you. She masks her man with her lips. He is her possession. You've given every girl that wears your lipstick the gift of total ownership. Make don't mind the ownership one again yeah, there's okay. a lot of ownership <laughs> <laughs> like it's kind of salacious sure but like what's going on <laughs> but um i mean it's a nice sentiment um but it feels like isn't wouldn't you want something that like stays on you know rather than something that marks people i don't know and- i don't know enough about makeup I think it's, I like it. I think it's cute. I think it's classical. I think that the iconography around like um, lipstick stains and something mm. is something that hasn't like died out ever. But um, the ownership thing coming back up is a little it's bit. classic. Noticing <laughs> <laughs> a trend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a moral <laughs> reversal, which is nice. The, the pitch that I wrote um, goes like this It's clean, it's simple, and it's tantalizingly incomplete. What's missing? One thing. Pass the Heinz. It's Heinz. It only means one thing. It feels like half an ad, but that's the greatest thing you have working for you. It's not the photo you take or the picture you paint. It's the imagination of the consumer. They have no budget, no time limit. And if you can get into that space, your ad can run all day. It's a testament to catch up and there can be no confusion. So is it meant to be like Super simplistic kind of thing. Super simplistic. Straight just the past the hinds. Mm. I like this one. Yes. Yeah, I think maybe. Me like, too. yeah, I don't think you need the bottle. Hines is iconic. I think the yeah, simplicity is enough here. Yeah. Yeah, Especially with like the, the font as well. Like, instead, mm. instead of white. Because mm. so everyone knows Heinz. Yeah. When you say past the hinds, do you think of their beans? Do you think of their, you know, all their other sources? You think of ketchup. I, I think that's the one kind of yeah, product. Yeah, I mean, I hate ketchup personally, so I think of beans, even though I don't like beans <laughs> either. But <laughs> I think it is very iconic enough for like people to associate just the word straight with the the ketchup. Yeah, it um it implies that this sort of food is never complete without that brand either, which I think is really good for the image, um, because your mind instantly makes the connection. Um, yeah, I really like it. Mm-hmm. Like it doesn't even say have, past uh-huh. source, it's like specifically that brand, just I think it's really strong. Yeah, you can like even you have know, a, like <clears throat> as part of a poster. Like I just thought now, like a hot dog as well would be incomplete mm-hmm. if you just had a picture of a bun and a sausage. Like that would yeah. also be true. Mm. Bit of lack of lack of ownership in this um, pitch. 
<laughs> we caught on, Pat? Yeah, of course. Now, that was good. I like that last one. I know, I know what you're all thinking. They're too good to be my work. <laughs> you're absolutely right. This was taken from Mad Men. So, the, so that's why. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, my. oh shit. <laughs> Evelyn, you said that it's very 50s, 60s vibe, the, the way that they were going on to that. And I literally, I literally was like, oh, no. She's on it. I'm <laughs> sweating. I've never seen it. Don't worry. It makes sense now. <laughs> that's all for today. Thank you guys so much for coming onto the show. It's been an absolute pleasure for hearing these pitches that weren't necessarily mine, but I got you. That was classic. And to hear your input as well. Um, so now we're going back to Bella and Alana at the studio. So we'll see you guys there. Absolute cracker of an episode, Ben. Thanks, Ben. Now it's time for our next thing segment. Kids draw things. For this segment, we've asked some kids to draw the logos of some pretty famous brands. And we want you, Tom, to try and guess which brands these kids have drawn the logos for. Are you ready? <laughs> Let's take a look oh, at our first yeah. logo. <laughs> So here's our first logo. Tom, what do you think this brand logo belongs to? I mean, it's it's a fantastic, fantastic Apple logo. That's a um a grade one. So like how old's that? Seven years old? Seven. Yeah. Not bad. Good. Um, and there you are. There's correct answer. So I one point. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at the next I logo. Like the, I like the addition, I like the addition of the extra kind of teeth mark where the yeah. uh, Oh, yeah, yeah. They took some creative liberty with that. Better, better. They should have done that. <laughs> and now what do we oh. uh, have here? I mean, that is very obviously the Twitter logo, and it is a wonderful, wonderful version of it. <laughs> I, can, I can almost sense the movement as it flaps away. <laughs> And that's correct. When we were um, having a look at this one, one of our team members thought it was a bush. They had, they just could not see the bird at all. <laughs> there seems to be a theme. Are they all tech uh, tech companies? I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe not. Let's see. Mm, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. Let's see. What's the next one? <laughs> this one's so good. Uh, is that? Is it? Could, could I perhaps expect to see that on uh, what I'm drinking here? On a, on a mug of coffee. Is, wow. that, is, that, is that possibly Starbucks? <laughs> yes. I can't believe that I one worked was that one out. <laughs> that one was right. nuts. I'm not I'm not sure I saw the um the mermaid tail on the on the original on the, the original drawing. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was like hands or something. It was pretty funny. There was something going on. All right, let's take a look at the next one. I mean, it looks it looks like the sorting hat in Harry Potter, That's but I'm going to guess. But I'm going to guess that it is Mercedes Benz. Okay, let's take a look at the answer. Get you're in. Too, you're too good at this. You're really good. <laughs> oh, we chose I've like got, the messiest I've, ones when, we could. When you first said this, I was really worried. I was going to I was going to show myself up for not knowing anything <laughs> about branding, but they've right. done a pretty good job. Of no, that was excellent. Excellent. Yeah. All right, let's take a look at our final logo now. Um, yeah, we included two in these because we just couldn't decide between the two. Um, I'll be very surprised if you get this in the first go. I mean, no, I don't, I don't know. I'm going to guess <laughs> at Melbourne Zoo. <laughs> You thought we'd do that to you. <laughs> we're choosing no, them. No idea. It's going to be obvious, isn't it? No, not at oh, all. Oh, Red Bull. <laughs> oh. They did look like dinosaurs, though. They look like dinosaurs. I thought they were dinosaurs. Have you got, have you got di dinosaurs in Melbourne Zoo? No, no unfortunately, no. we don't. We but don't. I think if, no, I think there was a dinosaur park somewhere, but I'm not sure where. Yeah, oh, those road stops. probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That was a good decision to put that one last. <laughs> yeah, it was the it was the challenge okay. one. Let's cross now to Hungry News, where Perry will give us the latest goss on the ad world this week. Take it away, Perry. Good evening, and welcome to Hungry News. I'm your host, Perry Capnius. Our top stories tonight are brought to you by B and T, Australia's leading publication for advertising and media news. Last week we heard from Megan McEwen about some of Australia's communication regulations and now BNT has revealed some of China's regulations. 
The Chinese government has introduced new TB restrictions as part of a national rejuvenation campaign committed to resolutely put an end to sissy men and other abnormal aesthetics. This means stricter control of culture, religion, education and business by the CCP. Broadcasters have been told not to promote vulgar internet celebrities either, to vigorously promote excellent Chinese traditional culture, revolutionary culture and advanced socialist culture. And this is bad news for Chinese gamers. Anyone under 18 is restricted to three hours of online gaming per week. If you're not yet vaccinated and looking for a good reason to be, how does the idea of finding true love sound? That's the best case scenario, but if you're willing to catch anything but COVID, get ready to swipe till your post-jab arm soreness kicks in. Aussie Hinge users can now share their vaccination status on their profiles. Globally, Hinge research shows that users who have the vaccinated badge receive 30% more matches. You can read more about these stories on bnt.com.au. Of course, read any news comments section and you'll find at least one person comparing the grouping of people by vaccination status to forms of discrimination which occurred in other historical events. Only 101 years after the swastika was first used in Nazi symbolism, Victoria has banned public display of the symbol. The swastika was used in many traditional cultures around the world for thousands of years to represent peace or good luck. Lots of brands in the early 20th century loved to use it on fruit packaging, playing cards, and even Coca-Cola memorabilia. Many modern logos favour symmetrical, geometric designs, but have come under fire for drawing comparisons to the swastika, such as Slack, and even International Day of the World's Indigenous Peoples. For the ladies who want to spread good luck, this tote bag sold by Bell Chic is a reminder that typography matters. They later changed the font. This New York businessman had something to say about the newest business card going around the office. That Donald Trump's card. Trump's membership card was compared to Nazi memorabilia. I won't use the term grammar Nazi, but the spelling makes this pretty official. Look at that subtle off-white coloring. The tasteful thickness of it. Oh my God. It even has a watermark. Notice in the American Psycho scene, everyone spells acquisitions incorrectly. Eerie. Really eerie. That's all for tonight. Thanks, Perry. Now it's time that where we ask Tom your most pressing questions. This is Hot Seat. Um, and these questions have come from uh, submissions from our Instagram and Facebook page. And let's take a look at the first one. Just pull it up. Where is it? Here we go. Um, the first one is... Have you ever had to travel for work? Very good question. Yes, I have. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, on a number of occasions, uh, quite a lot around Europe and um, to the US and Canada, quite a bit, never to Australia. Oh, no. But you did come to Sydney at some point? I've been to Sydney a couple of times, yes, but right. that was for personal, personal yeah. uh, holidaying and to see mates. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, I think um, travelling is something that, uh, a lot of us students in the ad industry hopefully we'll get to do um, as part of our career eventually yeah, um, it's, I, mean, I mean it's not it's not as glamorous as you might right. imagine I've actually I've actually um, the more glamorous ones <laughs> when I've traveled with things I've drawn actually really? um, uh, yeah because they kind of treat you as some kind of celebrity that's um, so cool it's a bit bizarre but uh, but with work you know you often go to an airport get a taxi to a, 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 a white box room and then get back in the uh, back in the car and back to the airport. You don't really see much. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. Speaking of things I've drawn, um, we saw that you had a Gucci collab at one point and um, yeah, some pretty exciting things. So what's like the craziest uh, experience that has come out of um, things I've drawn? Well, I mean, so that's yes yeah, so it was it was the gucci collab there which is the, the i mean sitting on the front row of the men's fashion week in um in milan was was pretty cool just before just before covid hit actually um we also had a very nice trip to iceland um uh well i took took the whole family yeah. and uh we uh we did, traveled around iceland and we went on a helicopter it was pretty awesome and our next question is um, yes, as you mentioned previously, times have changed and, you know, we can't really meet people 
organically um, as much anymore. What would you recommend to kind of like junior creatives or, um, you know, a lot of, you know, graduating students to do to get their foot in the door? Right. Yeah, I've got quite a lot of thoughts on this, actually, but I'm sure we haven't got that that long. But for, right, there's a few things. So, um, so first of all, do treat it like a foot in the door, even if it isn't necessarily the perfect job for you. Really, really important. I, I talked about earlier how I got a job in a media agency, which I didn't think was exactly what I wanted to do. Um, I, you know, I bought telly, I bought TV. That, that's not what I necessarily wanted to do, but I made the job work for me. And, um, and it's important that every step on your career feels like it's going to the ultimate goal, which is what you want, but don't expect to get there straight away. You, you, you won't get there straight away. You won't get that perfect job. Um, next thing is when you have an opportunity to speak to someone or meet someone who is going to be useful to you or, you know, maybe a senior person in the industry that's going to give you advice, don't ask mundane questions. Do your research. Um, you're both smiling as if this is an obvious thing, but I, I've, you know, I mean, I see it happen time and time again. People talk to me and they go, right, so what it is that? You know, a junior person in, in media com, for example, will say, so what is it your job is? I'm like, no, 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 that's not the best use of either of our time. You can find that out and then you can ask me very pertinent questions or ask specific advice. Don't use that time um, asking basic, basic questions. So do your research when you meet someone. And then also don't let emotions get in the way. So if you um, say you've had a really bad day, right and then you go into an interview don't make or, or, or you know you have a conversation not an interview but have a conversation with someone don't let your um your if you possibly can let, let your mental health your the state of your well-being get in you know get in the way of that um, that conversation you're going to have it's quite a difficult topic really but you've got to try and get yourself in a in a in a in a really positive mindset so that you get what you want out of that conversation and if you're really in a bad place at that time I mean I would advise sometimes even you know saying look can we not have that conversation now can we have it another time um, people are becoming more more accepting and, and understanding of that kind of situation so you know make sure that you don't let your um, other things kind of cloud what you want to get out of that conversation with people. Yeah totally I think yeah being in the right mindset is so important um when I was ringing around for internships earlier this year um I would put on some like happy music <laughs> before I'd go I get on the phone just to like get in the right frame of mind Got it. so yeah Got it. totally yeah totally see how important it is we'd like to know what's next for you um project or work-wise uh I think the Mediacom uh with the launch of this new uh new uh, department or new division called creative systems is, is a really really interesting place we've, we've got this new fella in um, called Steph Calcraft who is one of the founding partners of Mother big kind of independent creative shop in in, in London um, and it, it's a statement really to the to the industry that media agencies are no longer kind of you know pretend that we're not doing creative stuff uh, and I think there's a whole load of really exciting projects that we're going to do both with creative agencies and also independently. So, I mean, my, my view isn't really beyond the next year or two of, of, of really kind of focusing on making the best of, 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 the, of this opportunity that we've got, working fantastic clients, fantastic projects. Um, in terms of the Instagram account, I've got a whole load of ideas that I often don't get time to do. Um, there's so much you can do with kids' drawings, not just photoshopping them into real things, but, you know, designing stuff. Um, we've had a book out. I'd love to do another book. Um, we've got a few other bits and pieces that I can't talk about. But, I mean, it's, it is exciting for things I've drawn. Um, and uh, I think there's kind of a lot of organic growth still to come from the, uh, from the Instagram account. Yeah, definitely. That all sounds very, very exciting. Um, with that last question, it brings us to the end of another brilliant episode of Hungry Talks. We have to give a big thank you um, to Tom for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us today um, and fill us in about the life of an executive creative director. You've given us all some amazing tips and advice as well as bring some much needed creative inspiration. So thank you again, Tom. Um, before we let you go, we'd love to know how did you find the episode? I think it was really good. Really good. I should have worked out my lighting. I'm sorry. It's a bit bright <laughs> That's there. okay.
Uh, I should have put a spotlight on my face so you could see me a bit better, but hopefully it's not, I'm not just a shadow. But no, I no, it's it really good. I enjoyed that. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. You're very good interviewers. Um, and I, I wish you every uh, every bit of luck with uh, with the series and uh, with, with what everyone's doing. And ho- hopefully that was useful to the viewers. Thank you again. And we, we really appreciate it. And we wish you um, a lovely week and take care. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tom. Students, if you haven't already, go ahead and download the brief from John's announcement on Canvas and get your ideas down. Besides that, we hope you guys have enjoyed the episode and we will see you next week. We'll be chatting with the head of creative and production from Walt Disney and have a look at some unconventional advertising. But for now, I'm Bella. And I'm Alana. And this has been Hungry Talks. We hope you have a groovy night. (laughs) 